Thank you, Edward. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for coming along to our talk today, which I really want to be interactive. I'm not going to give people lots of readings, but I will answer your questions about all things psychic as well as psychic phenomena, if you have questions. Also about anything that I present with respect to art and psychic matters, because uh, I feel that there's a huge connection between the two. And if you, uh, as students, you have studied art history, you know that there are many, many artists who have been spiritual artists, uh, done, in, have been inspired uh, through their own spiritual journeys and have painted or sculpted uh, very uh, beautifully as a result. But let's start someplace else. Um, first of all, what is psychic? Psychic is formed from the, the Greek word psyche, which means soul. And everything that is psychic pertains to the soul, the spirit, and the mind. Now, in my experience, everybody is born with psychic ability. But like with any talent, some people's psychic ability is more to the surface or more to the fore than everybody else's. So those people you can, you know, who are freaked out by their psychic ability, by their sensitivity, by being a psychic sponge or... Uh, I'm sure all of you have had psych some kind of psychic experience, like the telephone rings and you know who's at the other end. And you pick up the phone and you say, oh, hi, it's your mother, or, or it's Bob, or whatever. And you think, oh, I knew it was you. Or you think about somebody and a letter drops through the box, or you get an email, or you meet them on the street. Because everything is connected. Everything is connected. And our psychic ability is like what I call our radar. It's our safety system. It tells us you walk into a room and am I safe here? Do I like the energy? Do I like this person? Is it okay? Am I safe? So you've all experienced that in one way or another, right? <laughs> yes? No? Come on! <laughs> I said I wanted to be interactive. And I want you to ask questions too. So, um, now, how do we store this information? How do we store information generally? Well, imagine the planet Earth. It's solid, right? Well, according to regular physics, it's solid. But according to quantum phys physics, it's not solid, right? So, we'll just say it's solid. It's the the biophysical aspect of what we know as Earth. But we know, because we studied in science, that there are lots of layers to an atmosphere around the Earth, right? And each of these layers has a different structure and function, and yet they all interleave together. Now, in spiritual philosophy, there is a proverb, or an axiom, excuse me, that says, as above, so below, but after another manner. What does that mean? It means that there is um, a, a resonance between every level, and every level structurally and is, is structured different, but it functions, uh, sorry, structured differently, and it has a similar function. So there is a resonance between all of those levels. So as the Earth has its solid mass, it also has these subtle layers. So too do we as human beings. We have our physical body, but that is not who we are. It is only a part of who we are. Who we really are is our emotional, mental, and spiritual bodies, which are metaphysical, beyond the physical ability to touch. But we perceive it through our senses. And not only do we perceive it through our physical senses, we have psychic senses that parallel these physical senses. And uh, so imagine we are all now in this room together and we're all a bunch of cells with atmospheres. We're human beings with atmospheres that are all interacting together. So that's what happens when you get into somebody else's field. Sometimes you don't like their field. You think, ooh, I don't think I can trust this person but you don't know why, you just kind of get a gut feeling, 
or a sensation around your heart, or maybe you have a flash of a thought, like, oh, danger, watch out. You don't know why, and then you try and rationalize it. We live in a rational society that does not validate your psychic experiences. We are taught to systematically cross them out and say, it's not real, it must be my imagination. But as artists, we all work within the realm of imagination. We know that imagination is a magical and wonderful place, but it's also a place of danger and illusion too. So how do we sort out one thing from another. Of course, we need our lower mind to do that, our logical mind, but I think a lot of times people tend to overdo that. And they don't trust their intuition. They don't trust their psychic sensations or perceptions. So I never started out being, well, I started out as a child and uh, as a child, I saw the world in blazing color. It was wonderful. And I thought everybody saw the world like that. Well, I'm still walking around hallucinating, even though my feet are on the ground. But I know what it means. And it's not really a hallucination. What I see is everybody's energy field. And sometimes that's lovely. And sometimes it's not so lovely. Because people are people, and they carry their stuff around. So we're talking about information. So these different layers within our energy field each have a certain structure. So we have our biochemical body, and that runs by chemicals, doesn't it? Chemical signals and biological functions. So within our physical body, we have our endocrine system and our nervous system are the two systems in our bodies that are the most subtle and actually run our physical being. And those are connected to what we call in the next layer, our etheric energy is our electromagnetic body. And it allows our, the functioning of our nervous system to reach every part of our body. Because these bodies, they interface with each other and they're invisible. And they start inside of you, around every cell, and they're generated. You know, we have a gener we're generating our field all the time. Then we have what, uh, well, so then we have these chakras, uh, which are our centers of consciousness, and they go through our body and through the etheric field, and they actually are the signal posts for stimulating our nervous system, because it's connected to our electromagnetic body, and then the, each one of these chakras is also connected to an endocrine gland. So each of these centers triggers reactions within our physical body which lead us to having good health or ill health or, or whatever. So these are the active parts. Chakra is a Sanskrit word that means wheel and it spins. I won't blind you with all of this or bore you with it. It's actually very interesting but just to say then the next body is the colored body and it's we store all our in information as colors like a cloud of energy around us. And this is our denser astral or our personality body, and it stores current information. It's your current filing cabinet. And that's what I see. When I give people readings, and when you step into people's field, you say, oh, I like your vibe. You're tuning in to their current filing cabinet, their, their energy field, their astral field. And that's the active field that's processing a lot of information about now. And of course, well, what is the past and what is the future? Hey, it's all happening now. We, we also have a, another part of our astral body, which is less dense and stores, again, thought forms or information. Uh, but I call it our back files. And we can also pull things from the back files, put them in, the front, in the, our current files, and vice versa. Right? So it's an active system. So when psychics read somebody, it's like reading a book. You, we say, like you are an open book. Because if you're open, <coughs> some people come for a reading, they say, show me what you can do. And I think, oh, this is going to be boring because they're just putting up lots of blocks. They don't really want to know. They just want to test me. 
Well, every reading is a test for me because I have to perform. I have to be with you as an individual and do my utmost to perceive the bigger picture. You created this. This is, this is your framework. This is your psychology. This is how you're living your soul mission here through your physical body in the earth and how you're accumulating information in your field which is part of you. So that's a very, very simplistic or simple explanation of what a psychic does. A psychic has learned how to identify, tune in in much more microscopic kind of way uh, about you. So if you came for a reading, I would look at your current circumstances emotionally, mentally. I would look at relationships. I'd look at work or in your case, you know, where your career pathway was. I look, could look at your parents. I could look at your lovers. I could look at all of these different parts of you and I do it by focusing in. First, I open myself up, get my primary impressions and those impressions come from my psychic senses. So what are the psychic senses? Clairsentience. Clairsentience is the ability to clearly feel physical sensation. So when I sit next to somebody, all of a sudden I could get a pain in my knee or a pain in my liver or feel chilly or, you know, I, you can have, I can have a funny taste in my mouth and this is in connection with the person that's opposite me. I know who I am and then I tune into them and I can physically translate the electromagnet, through an electromagnetic frequency their physical aches and pains and energy state. And that's how I give a health reading. I can scan through. And a lot of people have this clairsentient ability because it's about our connection to place. And it's what we call uh, the gut feeling. So you've all had that at one time or another, I'm sure. The next psychic center that has a, a, a strong impact on us is our emotions or empathy, clear empathy. And you know, you go to a football stadium, you go to a crowd, it's like there's a crowd emotional energy. Oh, they scored a goal, you know, and everybody goes wild. And even if you're not really that excited about it, you can get caught up in it because it's an emotional wave that gets sent out and then we are affected by it. Or you walk into a place and everybody's really depressed and you are like happy and all of a sudden, <laughs> right? <laughs> We've been there, right? So that's clear empathy, walking in somebody else's shoes emotionally. And I perceive emotion like energy in motion. So when I tune into somebody's emotion, I actually move or get movement forward and back, up and down, round and round, whatever, spirals. And that's how I begin to interpret or tune into the emotional state of somebody else. And then we have something called clear audience, which is specifically connected to hearing, being a spirit medium and hearing discarnate voices. I'm not so good at that. That's not my <laughs> natural way of tuning in. Some people are. Some people naturally, like, oh, it's like they're talking in the ear just like I'm talking to you. But it doesn't happen to me so much. Um, it's not part of my natural gifts. I've only had it once and believe me, it was a huge shock. Like, what is that? <laughs> it was shocking. Um, so it never happened again, but it doesn't mean I can't connect to spiritual, other discarnate energies. I just don't hear their voice. I can hear an echo almost, but it's more distant and observational distant from me. The next one is clairvoyance, and that's my big gift too, which is clear sight. And it's about images, so it's seeing colors, patterns, moving pictures, or still pictures with my eyes open or my eyes closed. And even blind people can see colors. Even though they can't see external sight, they still have internal sight and the ability to see color and shape and form inside. And they interpret that. Um, and the last one is intuition, connected with the crown level. One could call it telepathy, but it's not exactly telepathy. It's more like 
just having a, a thought come into your mind that has nothing to do with your lower logical thought. And I'm sure you've all had that happen to you too. So, I never started out as being interested particularly in or knowing what to do with my ability to see auras or feel people's energies. But what I did do was decide to become an artist. Because then no matter what I did, everybody would say that was very creative, that was wonderful. You know, oh, that's a wonderful vision. And it gave me permission to keep my perception open and not close it down. And that was a completely unconscious decision because I decided when I was eight years old, this is what I want to do. I want to be a sculptor. I want to be an artist. And so when I, I did go to um, a, a university, uh, but I decided not to I, and to, I decided to be an art major, but um, I thought that keeping my mind open was really the most important thing because I'm very interested in languages. I speak lots of languages, and I wanted to learn about philosophy and all kinds of things, aside from just art, because I thought, for me, being an artist is about having an open mind, and it's about perceiving the world in a different way from other people. So it led me to question it today for you, what is the connection between the psychic dimensions and artists and art? And that's what's really interesting because they're my two passions in life. Um, it's about vision, it's about perception. And I've talked a little bit about perception here and how I carry that out in terms of my work as a reader to inspire to guide, to be a mirror to other people's experiences so they can see what they've created. And in a way, that's what artists do. Artists have a driving need to communicate, to communicate their vision and their internal experience and find a way to put it out there in order to inspire people to change their vision or their kinesthetic relationship to the world or their philosophical attitude towards the world. This is what, to me, art is. It's about taking your internal perception and through various media, however you choose to do it, digitally, you know, in a much more classical way, painting, drawing, printing, whatever it is, and inspiring other people to have a different vision of themselves in the world. So um, a lot, the other thing that's interested me when I was studying art, very briefly, because I can talk for America and the UK, uh, is that many artists also have some kind of per perceptual blockages or impairments. And this is very well recorded through history. Um, you know, people having visual, you know, eye problems and they don't see the world in the same and they draw it and people go, oh, that's amazing, but that's how they see the world. And you can think about the different, um, different artists such as William Blake, who was a spiritual art, you know, took his spiritual visions and, and laid them out in the most incredible ways, or even somebody like El Greco, who every time I look at his paintings, I think, oh my God, how can he be, how can he have painted in the 1700s? I mean, it's crazy, his paintings, you know? Um, and you look at somebody like Kandinsky, who painted music, um, Odion Redon, who was a mystic and probably took lots of drugs, uh, <laughs> Rothko, who studied Kabbalah and, and mysticism and put his work out there. So these are people's internal um, workings through their art to help other people, in a sense, understand them. And they're compelled to actually, through color, line, shape, or the word, to get it out there. So I think that um, I'd like to open the floor to questions now. And please don't be shy. If you have a question, I'd like you to stand up and really s say it um, loudly so I can hear it. And um, if nobody else can hear it, then I will um, repeat it for everybody. Okay? 
questions? You mean you're going to make me talk for another four, half an hour? <laughs> yes. Yes, please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if I stand right here, do you get confused with her energy and mine? Okay. That's a good question. And so, can I use it to like hide my energy? Okay. <laughs> right. So this gentleman asked me, because he's sitting next to somebody quite closely, is, can I discern the difference between his energy and her energy? Yes, I can. <laughs> Aside from the fact, you know, of your physical form, your, and what I see, what I perceive is a, a melding of, of energies together. So you would have like a circle and a circle, and then there's this interface. And the, the more you connect with each other, if you talk to each other or interact in a more intimate way, then what happens is... <laughs> that there's a, a further blending of energy. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's really brings me to the fact that, you know, when we have relationships with people, it takes a long, it takes a while to get that person's energy out of your energy field. Ooh. <laughs> It's true, it's true. And if you have a long relationship, one of the, the problems that people you know, have, oh, is he going to leave me? Will he come back? Will she come back? Is it, you know, all that angst that you have when you break up a relationship, it actually, you can feel that person with you almost. You know? and, and you can also, it's very common that people like dream of people and, you know, and at the si same time. And it's because you're, you know, it's not just fluids that have been <laughs> shared. It's actually, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> getting down and dirty here. Um, it's, it's not just fluids that share, it's electromagnetic energy and, and an emotional investment and a lot of, just think how much you fantasize about your partner or your, your friends, you know, in whatever way that is. Or you, we can call it fantasize, we can call it think about, okay? And when you think, you, have, you create something called a thought form. And a thought form is exactly that. It's an image and a thought. And what binds them together is sensory experience. The stronger your sensory experience, the stronger your memory. The stronger the memory actually is. And I'll tell you a funny story. I, the first time I saw one of these thought forms really so clearly, I was giving a reading to a lady and I was tuning into her and I saw actually, it was almost like, you know those old posters of the Cunard ships with the, with the funnel and the, the, the smoke coming out of it? You know, <laughs> right? Well, I saw one of these coming toward me and I thought, oh my God, I'm seeing this ocean liner. She said, oh, that's because I've been thinking about for the last 20 years like saving up to go on a, on, a, on a world cruise. So that was a thought form that was so almost solid in her energy field, like, like a movie coming at me. It was really, you know, it was a, I had learned about thought forms and I'd seen them, but nothing like that. That was really shockingly the first time. So to come back to your question, because I haven't forgotten, uh, so I can differentiate different people's fields when they sit next to each other. I can also usually tell when people have a relationship with each other in some way, shape, or form because there are energy links between their, their, their chakras. And you can never hide behind somebody. You only, that's an, your illusion. So I'll leave it at that. Right, who would like to ask a question? The lady up there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if thoughts can get in the way of your prayers. Like, if it has a, an entity or energy in its own, it can get in the way of your prayers. Good question. Okay, so this lady asked whether thoughts can get in the way of one's psychic perception. You called them clairs, but, that's, but there's intuition, which is not necessarily a clair. <laughs> it's a jaunt. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> New York. 
can't take the New Yorker out of New York. Right. Okay. Um, yes. So I talked a little bit before about how we tend to invalidate the, the psychic messages that come through to us uh, because we're taught that they're, you know, it's our imagination, they're not real. And uh, we also can therefore block by overthinking those perceptions. You still have had those perceptions, but whether you can believe in them or act on them is another story. So uh, based on that question, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you tell the difference so that perhaps you can experiment for yourself. So basically I say we have a lower mind and we have a higher mind. So our lower mind is called our list maker. We all know that and it's also the tape loop mind. Blah, 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 you should do this, got to do that, blah, 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 says that. You know that mind. Right? That's the one you're talking about. Full of doubt, full of fear, often, and full of lists, the shoulds. And you know that it's your lower mind, which, by the way, doesn't mean it's inconsequential or unimportant, because your lower mind, because it's a list maker mind, helps you make things happen down here. So it is useful, but it's far too ego-driven. It's fed gluttonously, you know? It is fed by us. You know, we give it lots of attention. We give it lots of energy. And so it just keeps going on and on. It never shuts up in its tape loop. And that's the one we have to quiet down because in order to get to our higher mind. So our higher mind is connected to our intuition, our higher mental state. And that mind is simple. It says, yes, turn right, no, good one, whatever. It just says things very, very simply, quietly. It usually doesn't repeat itself unless it needs to. Um, and that's your higher mind. Often it's accompanied after you get the thought by some kind of feeling some kind of central sensation, either a, an image and then an emotion and then a gut feeling. And that kind of sense of what I call centeredness. And if you follow it, you're right. So in, in, in the future, if you get a higher mind thought, try following it for a change. Take the risk because you've been following the lower mind for a really long time. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you that many times you're saying, I wish I'd listen to myself. So it's really that simple. Listen to yourself. That self, not that self. Thank you for your question. Good question. Another question. Ooh, whoa, lovely, lovely. Okay, this lady in turquoise. Oh, sorry. Who? <laughs> Which one? Which? That lady? Come, stand up, please. I'll get you after, okay? <laughs> um, how do you actually differentiate between your higher mind and your intellect? Your higher mind and your what? Intellect. Intellect, okay. Well, there is a subtle, there is a subtle difference. Intellect, in its truest sense, has to do with your ability to work through things, you know, kind of in a, in a seemingly logical manner. Um, and your higher mind is not connected to your logical mind. For example, Einstein got the theory of relativity in his dreams. So that was his, in his dream state, his higher mind, his higher self gave him the answer, E equals MC squared. And then it took him 30 years of making equations 
from his intellectual capacity and his knowledge and his ability to extrapolate, that is his intellectual mind, in connection with the idea E equals MC squared that he got in a dream. Now, if you want to develop your relationship to your higher mind or to your higher self, as we say, then the best way to do that is through meditation. Now, meditation can sound like a very difficult thing. And yes, I always say I'm practicing meditation because I've been practicing it for a long time. And some days it's great and some days it's not. But meditation, there, you can have physical meditation like Tai Chi or running. You know how you get into that zone when you walk or run or do something physical. Breathing, visualization, contemplation. There are many different ways to find a way to come into your meditation state. Or making art. When you get into the zone rather than being blocked by, oh, I should do this and I shouldn't do this and I'm going to mess it up, I'm going to, you know, there has to be a kind of abandonment of the shoulds and this getting into a place where you actually become a channel for something else. You get out of your own way. And you're not using your intellect for that. You're being. Pardon? Well, I suppose that there's an element of it, you know, when you're working on your, your piece and you think, you know, you're channeling, but at the same time, you're thinking, oh, I need to take off a bit here or add a bit there or it needs some yellow or, or whatever. Um, there, there is an element because we can't completely separate these things. That kind of separation is just for our intellectual <laughs> self to be able to understand the nature of perception. Okay? Thank you very much for your question. Now, the lady with turquoise. <laughs> No. Oh, so he's a con man. Right. Okay. Well, whether you're a murderer or you con somebody out of all their life savings or, or, you know, however you commit that evil or against life ener uh, energy, um, to be a con man, you have to completely believe your story. Completely believe your story. So I would say that, you know, there's psychopath. Psycho you know, he was a psychopath. And so psychopaths have very, very strong convictions. And when they're out to fool somebody or to get that, they have to completely sell their story and they make it up and they hold to it. Most of us, when we lie, we can't remember our stories. <laughs> and we always mess up, right, at some point. But psychopaths have that, you know, sort of uh, very particular kind of mental aspect energetically that's very tight, very focused. Uh, I suppose that a lot of people, he could do it also because people don't believe themselves. They don't trust themselves. And how many times have you bent over backwards to accommodate somebody who you knew that it wasn't good or right or whatever, but you thought, oh, well, I'll just give them the benefit of the doubt. Well, you know, we do that. That's a minor thing, but it can accumulate into something major like that. So I hope that that's, that's been useful. Now, there was a gentleman down here, right? We didn't want to just to leave it all to the ladies. <laughs> Stand up, please.
great. Right, so the question was, do I believe in ghosts? And he's interested in the idea of how memory is stored in objects or places. <clears throat> Great question, and very pertinent to our time right now, of course. Okay, so when I was talking about the aura, I talked about the electromagnetic field. And every, every object... Now, if you live in a house, it has an electromagnetic field because even though we see this as an inert substance, it has a slow vibration. It still has a vibrational... It couldn't exist if it didn't have a pattern in a more subtle electromagnetic way. So when people live in a place, that place absorbs energy the energy of those people. So their thought forms, particularly the emotional context. So have you ever walked into a house? Have you ever, I don't know, or a flat? We, have you ever tried to let a flat? Okay, and you walk in, you think, this is an unhappy place. I couldn't live here. Even though the sun might be coming in through the window and it looks very pretty, but it has some kind of atmosphere, how many people, raise your hands, have had that kind of experience? Right, okay. So you have to pay, make note. Now, you can clear places of that, and there are ways to do it, clearing the electromagnetic field, and uh, you know, now is not the time to give that in detail, but you can use you know, holy water, or blessed water, you can use salt, you can use prayer, and, and incense, and you know, all of that stuff, and it sounds dumb, but it works. <laughs> it works. And every single culture all over the world, every single religion all over the world, uses these same techniques. Sound, perfume, candles, prayer, and intention, projection of intention, to clear spaces or to charge spaces. And it's instead of healing a person, you heal a space. You clear it. The same with objects. So in um, psychic work, you might go to a, a reader and they say, oh, give me your ring or give me a piece of metal, that's something that belonged to you or, or a scarf for a piece of clothing. Look, you've all watched Most Haunted or the, you know, the things that are, you know, the, where they're, investigating murders and they've got the, the scarf of the little girl that was dragged away or something and the psychic holds it and that's called psychometry. So the energy imprint of that individual remains within it. So everything you own is imprinted with your electromagnetic charge which is individual to you and can act as a link to you. It's called a witness to your energy. And that's why you say if you buy antique jewelry or antique clothing, you wash the clothing, you cleanse the jewelry, because it's got the imprint of the other person's energy on it. And that's why, okay, who here has cleaned out their closet and felt lighter? Cleaned, cleared the clutter and physically felt lighter? Okay, right, some of you. Some of you have not cleared the clutter. <laughs> but literally, you feel lighter because you've actually taken back your energy from all the things that you were owned and sort of carrying around with you all the time. So that's a psychic phenomenon. That's a psychic reaction or consequence of letting go. Now, do I believe in ghosts? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Well, let me say, I don't believe in ghosts, because that sounds like it's religion. I know that ghosts exist. <laughs> and I've had lots of experiences with ghosts, good ghosts and not so nice ghosts. So what is a ghost? A ghost is a passed over soul that refuses to move on to the right dimension to the spiritual dimension, and we call them earthbound spirits. So 
based on their belief that there is no afterlife, based on fear of being judged by the maker, um, or want, you know, refusing to believe that they actually died and that they think they belong in a place, and they refuse to go. So that's the simple thing. Now, uh, no, I think this lady first, then you. Then how are we doing for time? We're running out, right? Okay. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I can't hear you. There's an artist who took photographs of artists' doors. Artists' what? Auras. Oh, auras. Oh, right, right. Sorry, yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with the technique. I can't remember what it's called. It's called aura photography. <laughs> <laughs> Simply. Right. And so let's look at the irregular audience. <laughs> okay. Um, for the most part, uh, yeah, well, okay, let's take this in stages. Aura photography has gotten a bit better, but it's not really completely what I see because I see things in a lot more detail but it has become more accurate. Um, so that's all I can say <laughs> about that. Um, when, if you came to me and you wanted an aura reading, I would draw a picture of your aura and tell you what all the colors meant in the chakras and all around and um, what you created, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you about your past. I can tell you also about your dominant energy color and that's what I'm, kind of basically looking at when I look across the room, people's dominant energy colors rather than the details of their, of their aura because there are too many people here and I don't have time to really contemplate this because we are running out of time. Um, <clears throat> but usually you have a lot of green people, a lot of blue people, a lot of indigo blue people and some violet people in here and less yellow people. Red, I don't see any red or orange people. That's the seats. The red or orange people, like out there, like, they, they don't want to, they, they're just committed to action, action, action all the time. They're not really, in, you know, intro, more introspective, generally speaking. Not that they don't have to do that, because they do. Everybody has all the colors in their aura, because we are beings of light. And we channel, you know, our physical body is made up of, light in the form of, and color in the form of crystals, uh, crystalline energy, and then our astral bodies hold light as pictures, and our spiritual body holds that light as, as thought and mental body. So um, we translate this light and this color down through the planes. So there are lots of blues, blue type people are more create generally blue and gr green people are practical let's get it done let's be organized let's let's make sure it happens and they're they've got this mission about taking care of people taking care of the world and lots of people who are into sculpture bronze you know things that are kind of physical clay you know are they like working with materials in a craft way that that is very much the green type of individual. There are lots of blue people here, sky blue people, turquoise blue people, indigo blue. So blue type people are more dreaming, they're more introspective. Um, <clears throat> they have a very strong interest in the balance of things. Things have to be balanced. There's something that happens. Um, so I would say that most of the people for here fall into the, that spectrum or that part of the spectrum. Um, and lilac people are about the big dreamers, you know, the really big dreamers, you know, kind of feet barely touching the earth kind of feeling, but also interested in conceptual things around power, spirituality, nature of authority, that kind of thing. So each color has a certain spiritual mission, a certain psychology that goes with it, and that's what's so fascinating 
is that everybody is different, and yet we're made up of all these colors and all these unique kinds of distributions through our being. Thank you. How are we doing? So we have to wrap up. I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> Lots. Right. Well, Okay, I'll, I'll try and be quicker answering the questions, okay? So I, I know that they're, you, this gentleman here. Um, so I wanted to know what the relevance of dreams plays within uh, like and how much you should sort of think about them in terms of like your higher mind. Yeah. Okay, so the question was about dreams and their importance and how much uh, one should pay attention with them and what kind of connection do they have to your higher mind. I'll be really brief. There are three levels of dreaming. One is our absurd dreams, and that has to do with per working things out for yourself. So those absurd dreams are juxtapositions of memories, or it's your, your subconscious mind drawing stuff down from your database and putting it together, and, and you can problem solve, and you can find out about things, or, and sometimes those dreams are not what you think they are. But <clears throat> They're very important to write down, and there are ways of deciphering it, which is too lengthy to explain here in the context of what we're doing, but they are very revealing, and somebody like Jung, for example, in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, talks a lot about decoding your dreams, um, and I do too. Uh, <laughs> you can read it in my book um, <laughs> called Develop Your ESP by Nina Ashby. Just Google me, Google me. So there is a thing on dreaming, a, a, a small chapter on dreaming interpretation. Then there are premonition dreams, and that, uh, that's at a higher frequency, and they are snapshots, are things that will happen in the world, but it's very hard, and, and they're real. They're like being in something real. Um, and you're observing it, as if you were like standing on a cliff and watching something happen before your eyes. And they're very disconcerting because you know it's going to happen and there's a full emotional experience, but it's separated from where and when and how. And most people who have premonitions, they have them in cyclic manner. So two days, two months, two weeks, or you know, whatever, after the premonition, having that dream, it happens. So... And then there are astral travel, where you actually go someplace. You go and you experience it as if you're living here. You experience it in another level, and you're doing it through your astral body. So you leave your physical consciousness behind, and you float out of yourself, and you go traveling in other dimensions. So those are the three levels of dreaming, and you would need to differentiate. Thank you for your question.